And good day, my listeners. We're at chapter 12, verse uh, 1 of Second Chronicles. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel and Judah with him. Notes. Well, this uh, this Israel right here actually includes Judah as well in the mind of God, of course. Uh, Note, Judah uh, prospered, actually. Regrettably, prosperity sometimes is not actually a blessing. Too many times when believers are blessed, they do exactly as Rehoboam did. They forsake the law of the Lord. They start uh, forgetting him. Verse 2. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord. Notes. Well, in other words, the Lord allowed such because of Judah's backsliding. The Lord allows such in order to cause people to appeal to him. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Verse 3. With twelve hundred chariots and three score thousand horsemen, and the people were without number who came with him out of Egypt, the Lubims, the Succims, and the Ethiopians. Notes. With 60,000 horsemen and the troops that accompanied the cavalry and the horse soldiers were without number. I mean, they were like all over the place. Verse 4. And he who was Shishak took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Notes. Well, the only way that Shishak could have taken Judah, and especially Jerusalem, was because uh, Judah had forsaken the Lord, and the Lord was their power and their strength. Well, as long as they kept his commandments and his statutes, no nation in the world, nor confederation of nations, could defeat them. However, when they forsook the law of God, defeat was inevitable, really. Verse 5. Then came Shemaiah the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah who were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak and said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. Notes. Well, the Lord in his mercy gives Judah warning. No warning could have been more clear than this. If we follow him, we will receive his blessing. If we forsake the Lord, he will allow enemies to intrude upon us. Our blessings are totally tied to him. Verse 6. Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves, and they said, The Lord is righteous. Notes. Well, I hate to say this, but regrettably their repentance was not very deep. But nevertheless, the Lord honored it. When they said the Lord is righteous, this means that they knew that he was justified in what he had done and that they actually got their just deserts. Verse 7. And when the Lord saw that they humbled themselves, the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, saying, They have humbled themselves, therefore I will not destroy them, but I will grant them some deliverance. And my wrath shall not be poured out upon Jerusalem by the hand of Shishak. Notes. Now, notice the words, some deliverance. Well, they would not have a complete deliverance, only partial. Well, the reason for that is their repentance was partial. Therefore, their deliverance is going to be partial. Verse 8. Nevertheless, they shall be his servants, that they may know my service and and the service uh, of the kingdoms of the countries. Notes. Now, this meant that Judah must learn to obey and know the difference between serving God and serving ungodly nations. If they persisted in their ungodly ways, they would serve ungodly nations. And sadly, that's what ended up happening. Verse 9. So Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took everything. He carried away also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Notes. Now to be sure, considering the riches that Solomon had amassed, what Shishak took must have been (laughs) 
uh, truckloads. Well, let the readers and listeners understand this. Satan desires to take away our spiritual treasures and everything else. And he will definitely do so unless we minutely follow the Lord, uh, which means to minutely follow his word. And the message of the word of God is basically Jesus and him crucified and you putting your faith in such. If you don't do that, destruction is the end result. Verse 10. Instead of which, King Rehoboam made shields of brass and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. Notes. Now, the world robs the church of divine realities and public worship, and the church tries to hide the loss by substituting imitations. How many churches presently have shields of brass instead of shields of gold? You see, these shields of gold represent deity. They are symbolic of God's glory, protection, and power. Shields of brass are symbolic of man and man's ways. You can read that in all through the typologies of the Word of God. This right here shows you their condition. They went from having solid gold to more than bra- uh, little more than brass. I'd rather have gold. Verse 11. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them against into the guard chamber. And when he humbled himself, the wrath of the Lord turned from him, that he would not destroy him altogether. And also in Judah things went well. Note. Uh, humility, I like to say, is the only coin that will spend in God's economy. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 2, kind of, sort of documents that. But anyways, verse 13. So King Rehoboam strengthened himself in Jerusalem, and he reigned. For Rehoboam was one and forty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah the Ammonitus. Okay. Verse 14. And he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. Notes. Well, what an indictment we have right here, but uh, I can think of quite a few uh, that are exactly like that. Verse 15. Now the acts of Rehoboam, first and last, are they not written in the book of Shemaiah the prophet and of Edo the seer concerning genealogies? And there were wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David, and Abijah his son reigned in his steed. Notes. Now the... uh, the book of Shemaiah the prophet and of Edo the seer, these are a continuation of the registry of David's genealogies. Um, I don't know exactly where or if they've ever been found, but uh, I have no knowledge of where these books are or anything, but if someone does, please feel free to inform me. I'd be much pleased. Chapter 13. Now in the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam began Abijah to reign in over Judah. And he reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Micaiah, the daughter of Uriel and Gibeah. And there was war between Abijah and Jeroboam. Notes. Well, the conflict between the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah continues and will increase even as we shall see, and for some interesting reasons. Verse 3, And Abijah set the battle in array with an army of valiant men of war, even 400,000 chosen men. Jeroboam also set the battle in array against him with 800,000 chosen men, being mighty men of valor. Notes, well, a few years before, Rehoboam could muster only 180,000 chosen men. Now, this indicates that many thousands of the northern confederacy had come down to be a part of the king of Judah. The Holy Spirit wants us to, to note that even though these troops of Jeroboam were mighty men of valor, they still could not overcome what God had decreed otherwise. And we must pick up in chapter 13, verse 4, very, very quickly. Thank you, and God bless.